Okay, welcome to everyone um, on this uh, final event for Africa Week. I can see our participants are still coming in. Um, so welcome to all of you as you come in. Um, I'm just going to uh, begin by just saying uh, uh, welcome to this final event. Um, huge thanks um, to everyone um, on behalf of myself and, and the co-chair um, for Africa Week, Dr. Kieran Mitten. We're so grateful, so thankful to all our fantastic speakers, our chairs, organizers, contributors, our performers as well. Uh, we had a fantastic performance yesterday. Um, for taking the time to share your expertise, your work, your insights with us here, and very specially across our partner institutions um, all, over, um, all over the continent as well, continent of Africa, that is, of course. Um, and thanks so much to the participants that have joined us also to reflect and to share and to exchange ideas over this week. Um, for those who have not managed to see everything, we do have videos um, of, of all the events. We're going to be recording this as well up there so you can uh, uh, watch those, watch those you missed. So if you enjoyed something so much, you can watch it again and do please share and disseminate. Um, there's really some fantastic material up there. Um, so my thanks to all. I want to, uh, before we begin this, um, just to acknowledge the wonderful support of our core team that has been central to making this uh, happen. Um, James Bagley, Jessica Bordes, uh, Stacey Francis, Hubert Kinko, Danielle McDivitt, Njoking Ngunyi, Nancy Limo, Lorena Johnson-Prince, and Lucy Wildman. Thank you so much to all of you. There are many more people to thank um, as well. We're really, really grateful for all your support through this. So um, coming to uh, business of today, the business of this uh, session, uh, we're here uh, to discuss some of the issues that we can identify as underpinning, um, you know, I think many of us, that's why we're here, underpinning the recent an ongoing widespread youth-led protest to end to demand an end to the special anti-robbery squad known as SARS um, in Nigeria, the specialist pol police uh, policing unit. Um, and this space is supposed to provide um, an opportunity for us to reflect on a long-standing and globally relevant debates around police brutality. And more generally, I think what many of us can describe as a problematic interactions between state security actors and the populations that they're supposed to serve. Um, while we're focused on Nigeria here, of course, I think we can agree that these challenges are not unique to Nigeria. Um, my, my, one of our keynote uh, speakers this week referenced the fact that we have the flying squad in Kenya, for instance, the hawks um, in South Africa as well, when we speak of the African continent. But of course, a, a lot has gone on this year around the Black Lives Matter protests um, and a lot of those, um, uh, those discussions, those protests centered around uh, police brutality, especially towards um, black uh, people and ethnic minorities more, more broadly. Um, I think another important element of the conversations that we hope to have is the extent to which the history um, of security institutions um, has a role to play in what we see today. So a history uh, where these institutions were set up to subjugate particular parts of society. When we think of the African context and the colonial legacy, um, this was you know, a history that was, um, I, I guess we can see that history as founded on a racist logic that was um, how uh, the, 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 these colonial institutions were uh, subjugating the colonized uh, uh, peoples. Um, so I think that's a very important element that we need to think about here um, today. This is a very fitting final event as it, it adds a layer to some of our conversations through the week. Um, uh, Dr. Morunga had spoken uh, on Monday actually about uh, the need to move from a conversation about reform to one of transformation. And this is something that's very pertinent in debates on security sector reform and security sector transformation. And those are some of the issues we'll touch on um, today. Um, we also saw, saw how um, uh, Prof Professor Lushaga uh, encouraged us to have a more complicated engagement with histories and their intrinsic uh, links to the lived realities and experience in the current, in the current period. So that we will also draw on some of, um, um, of that logic in our conversations today. And then of course, finally, last but certainly not the least, um, was uh, what we can draw on from Dr. Okechi's keynote on global blackness and transnational solidarity. So in a sense, the significance and complexities of sol solidarity 
as well as notions of shared struggles um, across Black people globally. So, you know, for me, this is a, a very important note on which to end as we come in here. So with that in mind, we've organized this event um, to share insights um, from, uh, from uh, those that are in our African Leadership Center community and the wider King's College London community. Those that are engaging intellectually and in high level policy context and influential practitioner, practitioner spaces with the subject of security sector reform and transformation, um, with the subject of uh, state and non-state violence, um, with issues around women, peace and security, and of course, with issues around transformational leadership. So these are some of the themes that we take with us um, as we progress into the session. Um, just in, in terms of how this will run, um, each panelist is going to give us some introductory remarks for three minutes, and then they'll, we'll have a, a conversation among them. During that period, I'll also um, invite uh, contributions from the floor from about three participants as well. Um, and then uh, after the first, this first segment of the session, we're going to um, uh, start responding to the questions that we have received. Having said that, please already uh, submit your questions using the Q&A function. Submit your questions through to us and um, we will get through responding to those when we get to that part of the session. So um, just a little note on our, uh, on our speakers. First of all, we have uh, Professor Dede Diego, who is currently the Chief of, convention, of the um, of Conventional Arms Branch at the United Nations Office for Disarmament um, Affairs in New York. He has served as the first ever Chief of the UN Security Sector Reform Unit until March of this year. Um, and he has a, a recent book out on the United Nations and Security Sector Reform uh, Policy and Practice. Um, so after him, we're going to have um, uh, Dr. Uh, Aki Olojo uh, speaking to us as well. He's a senior researcher in the Lake Chad Basin program um, of the Institute for Security Studies. He has written extensively on violent conflict in northern Nigeria, especially with reference to the roles of various constituencies, including religious leaders, governments, and affected communities. Um, then we're also going to have um, Comfort Lante, um, with us here, who is uh, the UN Women uh, Country Representative to Nigeria and the Economic Community of West African States, and she's also an ALC uh, trustee. I should have mentioned, of course, that Aki is an alumnus of King's and of the African Leadership Center, and Professor Obo also is a visiting professor with um, King's College London. Um, Fakria Hashim is also going to be speaking to us. She's a social and community development advocate in Nigeria. Um, she has been featured on multiple local and international media outlets as a social and political commentator. She pioneered the conversation on sexual violence in northern Nigeria through um, hashtag Arewa Me Too, um, which drew inspiration from the global um, Me Too movement. And she also founded the North Normal campaign to spotlight um, sexual and gender-based violence policy implications in northern Nigeria. Um, very fundamentally, she's of course a founding member of the feminist coalition that has been very central um, in, in terms of the uh, uh, response um, and support to the NSARS protest. Fakria is also a King's uh, alumna. Uh, and then we're going to have uh, Professor Fumi Olani Shaking, who is a uh, professor of security leadership and development at King's College London where she also serves as a vice president, vice principal international. But in this capacity, of course, she is speaking as a professor of security leadership and development. Um, and she's speaking also in her capacity as a longtime scholar on security sector reform and transformation um, across different parts of, of Africa, um, and also on processes of leadership, especially transformational leadership. Um, and it, it's in that regard, we're going to be hearing from her today. So with my introductions over, I'm going to hand over to Professor Ebo to get us um, started with his own introductory remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eka, uh, Dr. Ipe. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Um, and I'm here in my personal capacity, I should emphasize, I'm not speaking for the UN. Uh, but having said that, I must also recognize that the Secretary General has issued a statement 
uh, condemning the killings uh, in Nigeria. Uh, that is fair to say. I should also say that uh, since we have been given three minutes, uh, that's I think 180 seconds, there's not much one can do, but two important things I want to do. One is to appeal to us to try not to condemn uh, the Nigeria police, but to understand it. Uh, and I'll tell you in a bit more detail why we need to understand first. Uh, condemnation does, doesn't achieve anything. Uh, the second is that let's try not to lament. Uh, I find myself being a Nigerian that uh, that's difficult not to do given what has happened, but it just sort of distracts us. Let's focus on finding the solutions. Uh, the second thing I want to do is to provoke you uh, really by saying that in my own assessment, the Nigeria police on its own cannot be reformed. Uh, it is part of a broader security system. Uh, and unless we transform it, as I think Ika was hinting at, uh, we can only reform and reform and reform, and it will not change. For those who are Nigerians, you'd understand what I mean, that no matter how, how long you turn uh, Pandediam, it does not become Gari. At the very base, of the, of the Nigeria police are structural issues that we have to deal, deal with. And what we call, the, we have come to know as, know as the end SARS that's currently going on, is only a metaphor, it's a reflection of what really is a structural crisis of governance, particularly of security governance, uh, not only in Nigeria, but um, continent-wide. Um, and what you are seeing really is our failure uh, to unpack and to renegotiate uh, what are, were essentially colonial inheritances. Uh, and what do I mean by this? You will remember that uh, our security institutions were initially created um, to serve and to service the state and to protect the state. Sometimes, from the population, but the objective was not the population. And I'm not talking of just the, uh, of the police. I'm talking of the entire security system, you know, to you know, the, the function of Nigeria police initially was to extract taxes, possibly, um, and generally to put the natives, you know, under control. What is unfortunate is that having achieved so much so-called independence, we have not taken I think transformative measures to ensure that the security institutions that we inherited are now to serve the population and not the state. So that's why I was appealing uh, that let us not start by, uh, by condemning a police service or what should be a police service, but actually a police force. Um, because the Nigeria police in that sense is almost a scapegoat because it is the, it is the institution that is most routinely and most directly uh, engaged with the public. So it therefore reflects most frequently uh, all the contradictions, all the limitations that are, are, are in, our, in, this, in our security system but it is part of a broader security system. If you look at the military, um, it is not any more uh, accountable. It's not any more participatory. It's not any more transparent. If you look at the customs and excise service, uh, our entire security system uh, remains a reflection of the fact that security institutions are actually state institutions. Uh, and they are therefore a matter for the state uh, and by the state. Uh, and that is really at the center of the, 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 the crisis of security governance that we face. So at the end of the day, the questions that appear are, who guards the guardians? You know, uh, who oversees this, these guys who are wearing the uniform in our name? Uh, and these are questions that have led and reflect to very various uh, distortions for example, the gap between 
the legality of these institutions and their legitimacy, on the other hand. Uh, the, the gap between what should be the rule of law, but what is actually what I call rule by law, it's not the same thing. Uh, you know, when the, the law is used as an instrument, not of justice, but of injustice, how do you get security from that? So at the end of the day, what I'm saying is that security sector governance is actually a set of relationships. What we have are distorted relationships where the governance relationship is standing on its head. Those who are supposed to be serviced uh, are not being serviced. Actually, they are being expected to serve the institutions that should be theirs. And at, at the end of the day, uh, ending from where I started, what we need is a security transformation. Um, but that itself is part of social transformation. So the country, Nigeria, I guess many other countries need to ask some bigger questions of themselves. You know, uh, for me, I remember I used to say in some of our previous conversations, those, those questions relate around who are we as a people? What are the security institutions that we need to serve, to address threats that we have identified? How do we pay for these institutions? What are the relationships between these institutions? How do we oversee these institutions so as to ensure that those we give the guns to protect us don't then turn the guns against us uh, and that we are actually uh, beneficiaries and not victims of security institutions that are supposed to, to, to serve us. So um, that's what my three minutes allow. I, I suspect I may even have gone overboard. Uh, my intention was just at the beginning to provoke you and I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Professor Bo. I think uh, you, you, you achieved um, that objective. Thank you. I think you've given us a lot to, to build on. Ake, um, Dr. Akiola Olojo, please can you. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Eka, and um, very good evening, everyone. Um, perhaps good afternoon to those joining from a different time zone. So it's a real pleasure for us to speak in a panel with very uh, distinguished uh, experts, some of whom are in fact mentors. Um, there is so much to say, so I'll try to stick to the three minutes. I might go overboard with maybe one extra minute, but let's see. Um, I'll open up with just two or three points very quickly. Um, the first is that when we reflect on the recent NSAS protests in Nigeria and the crackdown by the police and the military against civilians, um, one can observe, you know, what I'll call a sad irony. I say this because the police personnel and those in the army do not quite realize, perhaps they do, that they are actually victims themselves of the same political system that the protesting civilians are trying to reform, or in the words of Professor Ebo, to transform. So um, I agree with what uh, Professor Ebo said, his observation about this being a structural uh, problem, you know, the structural nature of the problem we're dealing with. And you see, it's common knowledge that the, you know, the police, and especially the rank and file amongst them, you know, are deprived in terms of welfare policies that concern them, salaries and even training conditions. Uh, in the case of the army, there have been numerous occasions when officers have complained about salaries not being paid. There are those who are deployed or who were deployed to the Northeast of Nigeria and they deserted. In fact, some of the soldiers have actually committed suicide at some, you know, some stage. And in some cases, you know, some of them even fire gunshots at their superior officers. So we've had even soldiers, you know, I mean, we've had cases where, uh, you know, soldiers have actually, I mean, thousands of them have actually been killed. I recall a visit to Meduguri in 2015. And I remember even meeting one of the soldiers who was in his house, you know, he was on, you know, was asked to retreat from the front lines due to issues of trauma, you know, and there are so many of them like this. So in fact, from time to time, we see videos, you know, open letters, you know, which soldiers direct, you know, to the Nigerian president, drawing his attention to the conditions under which they suffer. So we can go on about this. And, you know, in addition to all of this is the fact that, like I said, thousands of them have actually lost their lives in battles against Boko Haram and its factions over the last 10 years, at least 10 years. And now these same soldiers are deployed against innocent civilians who are actually demanding on behalf of everyone 
including the soldiers and the police, that governance should be reformed. So ultimately, it's in their best interest that the protest actually took place. You know, one could say that. But of course, um, we know that you know, the soldiers were giving marching orders, you know, but it still doesn't take away the fact that the political system or leadership needs reforms. The second point is that the heavy-handed methods of policing, which contributed to the NSAS protest, were the very same methods adopted by the military against Boko Haram. And you know, this greatly you know, contributed to the escalation of the crisis. And we all know the story of Boko Haram. You know, it's been told so many times. I mean, Boko Haram remains among the top five deadliest terror groups, at least for the last three, four years. It's been cited in the Global Terrorism Index and so on. But let me just remind us of, you know, you know, the, you know what we're really dealing with, because it's much wider than NSAS. You see, the media often cites fatality figures in the range of 30,000 to 35,000. However, I personally think that we arguably have double that number because we must take into account uh, those who have died from direct attacks, those who have died you know, in the four countries, you know, in the Lake Chad Basin, uh, those who have died as a result of the humanitarian emergency and associated problems. So we may be speaking about 60 to 70,000 fatalities. Now this figure is more than the capacity of Nigeria's national stadium in Abuja and approximately perhaps the capacity of Old Trafford football stadium for those who follow uh, you know, the trends there. So in other words, we're dealing with the size of a stadium of dead people. You know? So if we bring our minds back to the present situation, we realize that we are yet to learn the lessons of the past, the same brutal methods which the police and the military adopt, which have also occurred in the past. And it's what you talked about at the beginning of this panel discussion about the role of history and how that you know, sort of unearths uh, you know, this cycle. The final point, and I'll stop here, is that since we're speaking before a global audience on this platform, it, we're, this is not only about Nigeria. I mean, you mentioned Kenya at the start of, your, of the discussion. And there are other countries in Africa and even globally to some extent. Um, we frequently observe that the media, you know, you know, qualifies Nigerians, you know, a lot of times as drug peddlers. Uh, you know, Nigeria is constantly mentioned among those who illegally cross, you know, the Sahara into Europe. Nigerians are constantly cited as individuals, you know, involved in advanced fee fraud and so on. However, even though you know there is the role of individual, you know, complicity in these acts, we must recognize that the more profound narrative is that Nigerians, in light of what has happened recently with the protests, are actually seeking to genuinely transform or reform at least the governance system. And a system which has in a sense been the incubator for the problems which they are protesting against or about. And the recent NSAS campaign by Nigerians clearly reflects this sincere efforts. So we've seen people who have risked their lives, their jobs, their time. Um, remember, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. So you've had people who've actually put themselves at risk, but then it's for a greater cause and one which is really about a genuine attempt to reform governance. So I'll stop here and hopefully we'll have the chance to elaborate further as the discussion unfolds. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, Dr. Lodro. Thank you. Um, I think that gives us again a lot of food for thought for our conversation. Um, I'll move to Comfort Lambden. In doing so, um, uh, also note that Comfort was a member of the ALC Board of Trustees. She no longer is at the moment, okay? Um, so uh, Comfort, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eka, and uh, good afternoon to um, the distinguished panelists and, and, and to all the participants as well. Thank you for, for inviting me to say a few words and maybe like Professor Ebo, I'm also um, speaking here uh, in, in my own uh, personal capacity as well. Um, I, and I'm speaking actually, um, as, as you requested around the issue of the links between uh, the Women, Peace and Security Agenda and the, the NSAS movement. Um, I think um, when I was reflecting on that, I, you know, the, there were three key words that came to mind, you know, uh, the, the, the words of voice, leadership and participation. I mean, those, those, those are the defining elements 
of uh, Security Council Resolution 1325, which as we know, it's the landmark resolution that set the, the entire framework for looking at women's role in, in peacemaking. Um, and, you know, this call for participation and, and leadership actually has informed a lot of uh, the international interventions over the last 20 years or so uh, to support women's role in peace processes. And I'm going to just highlight three uh, kind of areas where we've seen um, this advocacy. The first is around the, the importance role of women in mediation processes. And granted, after 20 years of this advocacy, we haven't gone very far, but it, the advocacy still continues um, uh, as, as an important priority. The second is also recognition of the role of women's uh, civil society organizations in all efforts to uh, build peace. And then the third is, is an example, the third example is around uh, supporting countries that have been affected by crisis or conflict uh, to um, have uh, put in place gender responsive security sector uh, institutions. And it's this third point that I, I think uh, provides a good starting point to look at the, the links with the NSAS movement because um, at, the, at, at, at the heart of that uh, movement also has been the call for security sector reform or transformation. And, and the question is um, how can we use um, that opportunity to really address issues of, of gender in, 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 the, in the process of the transformation. I mean, uh, we have uh, not just in Nigeria, but certainly in Nigeria, uh, we have very few women uh, re represented in the security sector. So again, um, this is an important opportunity. And if you look at how the UN uh, peacekeeping missions have worked over recent years, one of the legacies they often like to uh, highlight is the fact that uh, the UN supports countries uh, uh, to actually uh, have more representative security sector institutions. I mean, again, it probably transformation hasn't taken place, but if just in terms of the optics of security sector institutions, you see more women in these institutions where you've had UN peacekeeping missions support them. So I think in the context of Nigeria, where we have about 12% women represented in the police service and, and about 3% in the military, then there is um, a part of this, this process of reform definitely has to look at how issues of gender are addressed. And on the second point around um, giving more voice and leadership to women's civil society organizations, I think one of the, uh, the links you can see with the NSAS movement has been really the leadership role that women and young women in particular have played. Uh, who, they've been at the forefront of the movement, both in terms of uh, establishing themselves as, as leaders, as mobilizers, journalists, uh, and, and have really been the voice uh, of the uh, movement in, in many respects. And I think um, that also resonates with um, Security Council Resolution 1325 about giving voice to women. Um, and then at the third level, which is, uh, I think, critical, and that's also about the, the forward looking approach, how women's role in mediation, as I said at the start, that has been one of the areas where we've seen least progress in terms of the, the Security Council Resolution 1325. But at this moment, when um, we're, we're at a stage where uh, there's call for calm and more constructive engagement with uh, between the security sector institutions and um, the protesters, uh, we need to also see women at the table. And um, you know, with the panel of inquiries that are being set up, we need to make sure that women are at the table. So when it comes to negotiating um, the kind of uh, reforms that, that have to uh, be seen in the security sector, this is the moment where I think the, the, the real test, uh, because women certainly have been on the streets, their voices have been heard, but the real test of how their leadership is going to influence um, the, 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 the follow-up um, uh, arrangements is going to be now. But I do uh, certainly uh, remain hopeful that if we can harness um, 
the, the, the young women's energies that uh, have been expressed um, to find a solution going forward, then we will indeed perhaps uh, uh, go along the path of the transformation that uh, is needed in the security sector. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, conference. Thank you. Uh, Fakria, over to you, please. I would like to thank um, the Distinguished African Leadership Center for inviting me to be on a critical panel um, of the Africa Week. Um, it is an honor to be here with Professor Fumi, uh, Dr. Eka, uh, Dr. Akinola, Dr. Abel, and very lovely to see Dr. Com uh, Ms. Comfort again. On the 3rd of October, um, a video of SARS officials shooting, a young man in Delta State, Nigeria went viral online. This sparked outrage and the call for disbanding the unit resumed as they periodically did in the past five years. On the 8th of October, small pockets of protests began rising in a few cities across Nigeria. It was at this point that civilian response units were formed, such as the NSAS response, uh, NSAS legal, NSAS health. It was also at this very critical point that the feminist coalition, would, which had been formed in July for the purpose of driving the fight for gender equality, jumped to action by making NSAS protests um, a, prior, a priority. As a FEMCO, we, that's what we dub ourselves, a uh, founding member, we resolved to support these uh, pockets of protests along with all the units of response. And in the matter of a few days, we saw protests getting bigger and more states organizing protests of which we collectively came together to support uh, with resources. These peaceful protests continued due to trust deficit and the failure of government to show any level of empathy and commitment to justice. The NSAS protests were also an opportunity for young Nigerians to speak about their relationship with the state. And it was at this point that the Nigerian government began adopting appalling measures of disrupting the protests. Uh, first, they started by arming thugs uh, paying them to go and disrupt prote uh, protests. And then they gave the police uh, the green light to shoot at uh, peaceful protesters. The es uh, this escalated their adoption of violence by also sending the military to shoot at pr protesters which left uh, many dead. And after that, the military personnel that were on ground at the Leki Toge took the bodies away. And the next day, the, uh, the military denied any involvement in these deaths. Last night, we saw the Nigerian president come on TV and essentially issue veiled threats against peaceful protesters. Many ask if the NSAS protests has essentially failed right now as the government also parades itself as victorious for having suppressed peaceful protests. But I choose to speak up on how deeply these protests have shifted the mentality of young Nigerians to see how each and everyone that has contributed to the movement has impacted in no little way, so much so that the president, uh, that the government of Nigeria felt threatened by the youth that carry no arms or weapons but words and their, and their feet to match with consistency. Young Nigerians have taken the mantle of leadership that is empathic in responding to government's move to violence by protecting each other and asking everyone to stay at home to secure the lives of innocent Nigerians from the tyranny that we have seen escalated over the past few days. These response units mobilized by the Nigerian youth have also shown the average Nigerian what accountability and transparency 
looks like by consistently providing detailed accounts of resources used and deployed, whether financial, legal, or medical, something Nigerians are not accustomed to from the government at all levels. And many of us have begun to internalize these factors of leadership. We are at a point where we have how we would be able to move forward for the fires have already been sparked in the hearts of young Nigerians. And I choose to believe and trust that this is only the beginning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patria. Thank you. That, that's certainly a very important uh, contribution to the conversations we're about to have. Uh, please, uh, uh, Professor Lani Shaki, over to you. Uh, you're muted, sorry, you're muted. Thank you very much, uh, Eka. I will try to uh, discipline myself uh, to meet your uh, time, uh, you know, the, 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 the time limits that you have given us. But I just made an observation, which I hadn't really reflected on very deeply before coming on the panel. You invited me to come to this panel and I was excited uh, to do that. Listening to Fakria's uh, presentation, and I take a look at the panel, and see an intergenerational conversation going on with an Eka, Aki, uh, Fakria, and on, on one side of a new generation of Nigerians um, who are witnessing something uh, new in the way that they interact with each other, but who have been part of a process for the past 10, 15 years of putting together or, or living a new set of values. And I see myself uh, comfort Adedeji as that older generation. And it's a little bit emotional to observe because at a point in the nineties, we were you. And I think it's important to recognize that because of Fakria's uh, closing remarks. But, but here's my opening statement very simply that I agree with everyone that has spoken, uh, especially the earlier speakers that talked about the version of NSAS that we have now, which has been you know, uh, in the making for some time, but this was waiting to happen. This week was waiting to happen. And a confluence of factors ensured that this week came to pass in the way that we witnessed it. One has to do with the weight of history. And Adedeji spoke eloquently to that in terms of the colonial instrument called the security establishment that were handed over to us. But two, for too long, there's been a dialogue of the deaf between Nigeria's governing elite and much of the society about how we all experience security or insecurity, about how Nigerians experience it. Let's, let's put that. And three, for too long, there's been a deficit, or at least it's appeared as though there's been a deficit of new ideas to convene around and to govern our collective aspirations as Nigerians. So I agree that NSAS symbolizes a deeper malaise, a, a structural problem. But I want to comment very quickly on some of the conversations that we've been having. Uh, if you look at uh, the idea of the security system, I accept it's a system. And I accept uh, very much, I did that we can't look at the police in isolation of that. But something is missing still from this conversation because we talk about the state and then we talk about ourselves as citizens. But in the middle, crisscrossing the state and society is the elite. They are agents of the state, they are members of the state, they represent the state, but they also are members of society. And that's actually the canker that we're dealing with that you have uh, you know, a governing elite and a network of elite, let me put it that way, that have utilized the same, those same colonial instruments very much against their people. And the key point of governance of security is this, we need to really check at any point in time, whether the state representatives in a sense and the people that they claim to serve really have a common vision of security and we don't. It's become, I mean, it's obvious. And with the, the deep sense of, you know, uh, distrust that Fakria talks about speaks to it. But also I want to nuance this notion that the police 
uh, and I've heard it, even members of the movement, uh, you know, the, the coalition that, you know, pulled off this protest, recognize that there's a hierarchy, there's a very brutal hierarchy in the, uh, in the police, of course, across the security sector, and that therefore you have such lower ranking, lower paid people, and that's really the dilemma, that in that same institution, you also have people that wield so much power. They wield power across the board. And I want to suggest that there's something called individual responsibility and that just really receiving command is not enough uh, to act upon that command. In international law, there's something called individual responsibility and we're members of an international community. I will leave that there and close with this question of NSAS. NSAS is the real uh, newness for us. And what has happened in the last two weeks, that's the newness of the conversation. And I think what they have done, not even I want to suggest very, very strongly that what NSAS, what this movement has done is to begin a new national security conversation, or if you like a new national conversation with the state, the representatives of the state. And I think we really, really need to have a meaningful dialogue about that, how that conversation can continue. Not violently, of course, and they had not started that conversation violently at all, nor are they responsible for the violence. I think, that, I think that's the real story. It is not a leaderless movement. We've heard people say so many times, oh, where are the leaders? Let's talk to them. I think, uh, you know, our leaders, both within the, uh, on the continent of Africa and even global leaders, need to wake up and smell the beans that the young generation have chosen a form of leadership that has accountability built within it in which there are shared goals. And actually in leadership lit literature, you find distributed leadership all over the place. It's rotational, it's equal. And actually everyone takes responsibility for something. There's a shared vision to it. And so NSAS is modeling a form of leadership that ought to take her society to the next step. And it would be a shame if somehow uh, they have been shut up and put aside and assumed to have no agency. That agency is something we need to not just theorize, we heard that about theorizing um, you know, the moments, whether they're revolution or protest, whatever it is that you call it. And I think this is such a moment uh, as far as Nigeria is concerned, but we have seen that moment in the rest of Africa in the last year or two, the protests are generating something new, nonviolent protests. We saw it in Sudan. We saw how Zimbabweans have you know, struggled with what should have been a new period uh, of their history. We have seen it in other parts of the world and the Black Lives uh, Matter uh, movement that we're talking about reflects a sign of the times. And we need to study it right away and try to find intellectual leadership and thought leadership that guides this process forward. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I think that's provided us with a lot of material um, with which to uh, progress uh, conversation, first of all, amongst the, the panelists and some uh, colleagues that I will invite to respond as well. Um, now, I was wondering if Fakria said something very interesting, that these protests signal, and, and I think others have reflected on this a bit, um, young Nigerians in conversation about their relationship with their government or with the state. Um, which, which is a very interesting point, I think, perhaps that we could take off from. Because in that, um, I think Professor Fumi mentioned, um, you know, the leadership, the influence, even though it's he called it a, a, a movement without clear leaders, but clearly there's some sort of, if I use her language, some sort of exchange with, with, of mutuality with other groups. We've seen, uh, at least I've seen images of priests marching um, in support of this, mothers marching in support of this, um, all kinds of groups. And I think this speaks also to Comfort's point about the sort of the leadership of this, uh, um, this movement has taken, especially the role of young women and one of the groups that uh, Fakria is engaged with um, there. So I wonder to the panelists, what do you think about this idea that young Nigerians are in conversation about their relationship with, with the government, um, but also the way that they, we might have seen them exchanging neutrality with other segments of, of society and influence. Um, and, you know, are we seeing some kind of, they're speaking a language that others are listening to and understanding because they share 
um, what what what, uh, what they hear the young Nigerians talking about. Can I just jump in quickly and complete that uh, line, that thing about conversation? In the way I've observed it, and I think we use the notion of conversation to describe peace building processes before, peacemaking processes, but actually it's probably, it probably is more suited to the whole notion of security, especially when we tend to assume that the state, the security of the state and the people are one within a, you know, a nation state or any state, but they're not in this case. And I suspect that we've been having that conversation for a very long time. And so what do I mean? It's not overt dialogue that I'm talking about. We do it all the time. We write in newspapers, we have dialogue in the same that we're, you know, in the sense that we're doing it. But conversation, and it's not actually, it's not uh, my brainchild. In uh, 18th century literature, uh, you know, uh, in Europe, you saw in, in the long 18th century, how the notion of conversation even meant that you looked at how paintings spoke to each other about animate and inanimate objects in conversation. But the, the notion of talking and talking back through action or inaction is what has been going on in Nigeria all this time. That's what I was referring to as a dialogue of the deaf somewhat because the elite speaks back with this terrible policies sometimes, you know, uh, they speak back, the military institutions will speak in a particular way, but people either speak back to the state through music, theater, everything that we have in the economy, in the social setting has been citizens own way, uh, ways of coping and responding to what has been a form of insecurity, which is not just about safety, it's a combination of safety and economic uh, and social power that is absent for many, many citizens, apart from a small handful of citizens. So when that talking and talking back gets violence, because violence is a part of conversation. Boko Haram was a talking back to the state too of some form. That's when we respond. But when the talking back is in terms of protest that is not going anywhere, nobody listens. But when the protest is such a groundswell of response from ordinary people, especially the younger generation that do not necessarily do that because previously we recognized them as violent if they were in Boko Haram or somewhere in Liberia or Sierra Leone, we only associated violence with young people. And that's what is different about this conversation this time, that they spoke back to the state in such large numbers. And they also modeled a character of leadership, a form of leadership in talking back. But bereft of ideas, the state responded with violence and actually also an embarrassed state because we are supposed to be democratizing. So you cannot openly, but it, I think it's also an indication because you saw different kinds of responses in the state. It's also an indication that there is no unity about the kind of violence that was meted out by the agents. You know, there's no unity amongst the agents of the state. And these are things that we need to explain, you know, investigate carefully. So the notion of talking and talking back through various mechanisms, actions in action, silence is a form of conversation. And citizens are due silence and disengagement for a long time, but this time around protest in a very peaceful way, organized way has been a form of conversation that state actors uh, were not expecting. And I think it shouldn't necessarily stop it, not, it has to be converted into something else. Sorry. No, thank you for that. Um, was, I thought I was seeing someone uh, speaking. Okay. You're muted. Thank I'm you. trying to say something. Please, yeah. go on. Um, in relation to what uh, Professor Loni Shakin was saying about conversations. And I think there are some things that need to happen uh, before a conversation can take place constructively. Part of what I was uh, struggling to see at the beginning is how the subject of security is perceived or is assumed to belong almost exclusively to the state. Because we have failed, as I said, to unpack that colonial inheritance. I, I, I like the quotation by uh, one prominent Nigerian professor 
uh, and I like to always, I often cite it, uh, Nolly, who said that security seems to have acquired a mystique. In the minds of most people, it has become mystical, mythical, even mysterious. So you see, the conversation cannot take place unless and until security is seen by the government as something that also belongs to the population. If you look at the response of the government so far, you know, it has been on the basis of, oh, the president needs to talk to the youth because he's their father, you know, and the youth have responded and said, no, he's not our father, he's our employee. You know, uh, we pay the taxes uh, and therefore we employ him, we elect him and he's accountable to us. So this patrimonial patronizing assumption that the, the conversation that is taking place depends on how much space the government generously grants the population. It is a false assumption. And the youth are saying, you know, uh, you talk to us because we placed you there. Uh, we pay you to guide us, we pay you to protect us. And if you don't do that, then you are failing us. So you see, we cannot have this conversation unless and until we have the same assumptions about the conversation. Secondly, um, Fumi said that, uh, you know, talked about the, the lack of new ideas. It, it is true to an extent, but I think it's worse than that. Uh, is, I think it's the fact that maybe there are some new ideas, but it's the fact that there's no common national consciousness around uh, these ideas and the conversations that need to take place. I remember uh, the creation of Amotekun in the Southwest, Southwestern states. And how different parts of the country uh, understood the creation of, of, of Amotekun, uh, some seeing it as a contribution to security, others seeing it as uh, a threat to the security of the country. You know, so even if there are new ideas, they are not taking place within the framework of a common national conversation, uh, which I think is really where the point of, um, of the national conversation should depart from. Uh, over to you, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, Aki wanted to say something. Yes, yeah, so no, thank you. Um, I align my views with what um, Professor Fumi and Professor Ebo have said. Um, when we look at the current period, you know, it's quite symbolic in, in an important way. Uh, when we speak about the conversation, you know, October is a month or is the month when Nigeria supposedly commemorates its uh, independence, quote and unquote, from colonial rule. And in a sense, the current period actually, if you think very well, provides a very unique opportunity for a conversation to take place. And especially, you know, on the part of the states, you know, to actually respond in a way that, you know, this can, you know, happen. In fact, what, be what better way exists than to honor the rightful demands or, you know, the, the calls by, by citizens of a country, you know, those who have stood by the country for the last 60 years in spite of challenges. Now, there are two things which come out clearly here. The role of the National Assembly, you know, there seems to be a prolonged silence. You know, we've had one or two people you know, speak, but then there isn't that collective voice from a group of individuals who are elected officials, you know, elected voices of the people. They are supposed to represent the voice of the people at such a high level, not only in the House of Representatives in Nigeria, but also in the Senate. And all through the crisis, in the last one, two weeks, we've not really seen anything profound come from that side. And then the second thing is the prolonged silence of the president himself. I mean, yesterday we, there was a speech by the president, but then it took a while, you know, and even when you look at, you know, what was really uh, presented before Nigerians, you know, even the nature of engagement, the way the speech was even, you know, conveyed and how that happened, the timing itself, you see that there's so many issues that, you know, are yet to be addressed, like Professor Ebo said, before a real conversation can take place. The Nigerian president has, in the past, uh, I would say unjustifiably called the Nigerian youth lazy. But what have we seen in the recent SARS and SARS protests? We've seen a different story. 
the youth have demonstrated leadership in a number of ways, in spite of the challenges. You know, it, you know they've challenged, in a sense, the mainstream uh, idea about you know, a vertical structure of power. You know, like Professor Fumi said, they've actually unearthed a lot of resourcefulness. You know, we've seen young medical practitioners, you know, who supported, you know, the protest in very constructive ways. I mean, I have a sister who is a pharmacist. You know, we've seen lawyers, you know, offer free bonus services. We've seen freelance media startups, food vendors, you know, right to the ordinary person on the street, offering free services to the protesters, to the injured, and something which Professor Ebo said, I believe it's all about the international law, you know, and the statutes and how, you know, the, those offering, you know, services, you know, to the injured, to the protesters were actually prevented from doing that. Some of them actually even lost their lives, you know, and the right to life, which is an obligation that needs to be fulfilled, you know, by the state, by the security agencies was completely ignored. You know, so we see, we've seen all these things and really it talks about this whole point about the need for a conversation and of course the lack of it in the present day period. Very much. I think um, on this, um, we have a, a good um, a question coming from the audience where um, a point is made about how young people actually have learned to speak a new language. I mean, what has been referred to as this, this new way of organizing, um, you know, they've moved forward. We'll have Twain Adjawa perhaps speak to us a little bit about the role of new media, for instance. But um, as was said before, the state's responding in the language that they're used to responding in. Um, and in this case, one would argue in the, the language of violence. Um, how, uh, the question being asked is, how do our states learn new languages? How do they learn to speak differently? And I think linked to that, someone else is asking, that conversation is important, but without an effective communication strategy, how does you know how, how do we have these conversations? So comfort as you're leaving very soon, do you could you say a couple of words on that? Okay, thank you. Actually, um, I, I wanted to also touch on a point that uh, Professor O made. Uh, and, um, and, and link it to that, that it's probably not just a question of a new language, but it's also the new leadership model. I think that's a very interesting um, idea um, that the leadership model that has been expressed by young people and, 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 and uh, how do we all learn from that as well, I think. And, and, and I think that's worth interrogating. And so I think that's, that's um, a, an important takeaway. And, in, and within that also, I think the, the, the leadership that has been expressed by young women, you know, confronting a very patriarchal uh, system and structure uh, and doing so uh, in a very bold manner. I think there's, there's a lot in that um, because that transformation that we want, actually the seeds of that transformation that we're talking about has got to be found in, in, in that, in that boldness and in the way in which um, young people and, and including young women have, have expressed this. So I think that um, of course the, uh, it's still evolving, but there is a, there is a lot that uh, we've all got to, 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 to learn about how to harness this, this new leadership model, um, which perhaps finds expression in a, diff a new language as well, uh, in order to see how, how we, we, we move forward. And I think there's also a lot that young people outside of Nigeria <laughs> who are observing um, the, the, um, the unfolding situation are also learning. Um, and, 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 and I think that it's important that we, we, we get this right because I, 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 if this is, this is the leadership approach or leadership model that is going to define what is a very young continent, <laughs> then we, we've got to really engage with it and engage with it in, uh, uh, constructively. So I think that's, that's an important food for thought that we've, uh, we've got to uh, work with going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Now, the point on um, strategies for communicating, um, you know, a lot has been made of the role of social media. So I want to ask um, uh, my, my colleague, Dr. Tony Ajao, um, Hubert, can you, are you able to um, enable Tony to, to just give us a couple of words around 
um, around the role of social media in all of this? Yes, Doreen, um, <clears throat> you can now speak. I'm just trying to get myself unmuted. Hi. Hi. Thank Good you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi, welcome. I'm trying to see, um, have a better reflection as well where I'm sitting. Um, can you please, uh, Dr. Akar, repeat the question? Yes, I was saying um, the role of new, I mean, you're, you're a lot of, uh, Dr. Sonia Dow, of course, is an ALC alumna, King's alumna, is working on new media. And I want to, and I've written, you've written also about the role of social media and the protest. And so we just wanted to hear from you. A lot of people are saying this is a new way of communicating the effectiveness of this. You know, how effective do you think this has been here? Um, and what, what role is there for social media now, given uh, Buhari's, the president's response um, to all of this? Does this mean this will all die on, on, on social media? How, how do you see the moving forward now? What role does social media, could social media yeah. have? Thank you so much. I think without a doubt, we can see that social media has a very huge role in showcasing the creativity and the creative ingenuity of the Nigerian youth. We've seen this happen in South Africa, uh, feet must fall movement. We've seen it in South Sudan. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. In South Sudan protest, and now Nigeria youth are saying this is the age of technology, and we are going to go big and better in calling the attention of the leadership into our concern. And without doubting the role of leadership, it showcased this massively in the way. Many forces join hands with the Nigerian youth in terms of crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, as you've seen in the feminist uh, coalition um, uh, agenda. They raise so much money and disburse it accountably to many protesters to be able to continue uh, nonviolent uh, protest in different places that they are. So, without a doubt, I see the new media or social media triggering a lot of uh, unrest within the leadership of Nigeria as well. That's why you will see a sleepy leader, leader or a sleepy president waking up suddenly to realize that the lazy youth have almost toppled his government and without carrying any gun, just by being there tweeting talking and demanding for the kind of Nigeria see. And I realized that this is a very massive change in the way we see protests in Nigeria. For instance, yesterday after the um, response, the, 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 the response that the president finally decided to bless us with, uh, after he realized that he has no choice but to address us, he says so himself, that it has become important to come out and, and speak to the people. You know, it's like, oh, you bothered me, you woke me up from my sleep, how dare you? But then he made the speech that generated mass speaking to how it's not genuine, how it lacks empathy because it didn't even refer to the Lekki massacre. And the youth summarized everything he was saying to being, okay, I'm coming for you. You have social media, you have the international community who is no longer minding its business. And I'm going to make sure I dismantle but did not them from continuing making their demands known, uh, known rather. And what I realized today, I don't know if any of you have seen that, is that President Buhari has now apologized using the Twitter, Nigerian president Twitter account to finally speak out to the Lekki massacre that he apologized. That happened about three hours ago. He's apologizing without actually calling 
being ready to call to justice those people who perpetrated this atrocity. But what I'm referring to here is the fact that it's no longer business as usual. So you cannot keep quiet forever. You can continue to kill people and not recognize the new thinking that is coming forth through the youth agency and their creativity and the fact that they have technology at their beck and call to speak truth to power. So I think this is really uh, massive and it has really revolutionized the way do, we do protest uh, everywhere in the world. Thank you very much for that, Tommy. Fakria, please, can you... Um... Um, I also, as well. um, wanted to add um, an angle um, with regards to social media engagement that uh, we have seen um, sort of taking various shapes. Um, and it is, um, you know, the spread of the misinformation of fake news. Um, over the past uh, few hours um, from yesterday, we have seen um, how the denial of the military's involvement at the shooting in in the uh, at the Lake Togate has has planted uh, you know the seeds of doubt into the minds of Nigerians. So we have um, you know uh, a, a few journalists coming up to ask questions um, as if um, there wasn't you know the live streaming of the shooting of that um, of of that event. So you know essentially and and you know, some, as much as, you know, young people have sort of, have sort of uh, colonized, um, you know, social media such as Twitter and Instagram, we have also left gaps um, in terms of our engagement with Facebook and WhatsApp. And these spaces that we haven't really uh, taken over have become, you know, the, the bedrock of misinformation and spreading of fake news. And we have seen how that has played um, an immense role in, in you know, um, spreading uh, the information of what, what, what is going on on NSAS. Uh, so right now, um, the, we have seen a lot of um, uh, factions, uh, divisions um, on, on whether or not some of these events actually took place. And, you know, with also, the, the lack of understanding about uh, the the military's um, mode of operation that when you know they go to certain places and they commit these atrocities they kill people they take away the bodies that in itself creates a lot of uh, creates a climate of doubt um, about whether or not the events um, happened uh, we saw this with regards to the Zaria massacre of uh, Shias in 2015. And we're also seeing that um, with regards to the shooting at the Lekki toll gate. Um, but one thing, um, you know, one thing that is uh, sort of um, aiding this um, fight against misinformation is that, uh, you know, the penetration of social media and how documented um, these events have been, but also the the, uh, the CSOs, the human rights organizations that are already on the ground trying to unfold um, the events uh, which the military is trying to um, cover up. Thanks very much for that. Um, Akiala wanted to say something as well. Akin, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, I'll be very quick, so I'll allow others to speak. Um, Fakria raised an important point, uh, which also ties in with what Twin, Dr. Twin said about the spread of fake news. Um, one of the implications of this, if I may add, is that as young, as young people use you know, social media as a new language you know, to express themselves, you know, this is only going to get bigger. You know, it's, the dimension is going to get really uh, more profound as the years progress. But it comes with added responsibilities regarding you know, the gaps which young people need to be mindful about. So in terms of you know, the, the spread of fake news, we all know that uh, without a doubt, aspects of you know, the NSAS protests were hijacked. You know, there are gonna be facts which will emerge in the coming days and weeks, you know, but it appeared as if uh, you know, there was a sort of a hijack of the protests. And then you see fake news, fake videos and photos circulating you know, in, on the internet. So while the leadership 
uh, mantle is there, it falls on the youth, but then being mindful of how to, you know, sort of address these gaps is something which is very key. And then secondly, in terms of the language, it's not only about social media or Twitter being a language for expression. I think we can also see language in terms of uh, the language of empathy. And what do I mean by this? It's about looking at this problem of police brutality or heavy handed methods of you know, the military as something which is all encompassing. It's not only Nigeria, in Kenya it's there, in South Africa. And we must begin to see ourselves even in the, victim them, the victims of these uh, you know, brutalities. I mean, I'm Nigerian, but I live currently in South Africa. In, in August this year, during the lockdown, there was a teenager who was killed by two police officers. And the, the teenager who was killed was someone who was living with Down syndrome. I have a younger brother who has Down syndrome, for instance. So I can almost get a sense at least of what the family is perhaps going through, you know, to some extent. So by the time we begin to see ourselves through that window, that lens, that this is something that affects a lot of African countries, then we may begin to perhaps uh, you know, the approach might be more concerted and more, uh, more organized in a sense, more systematic. Uh, and I think perhaps it's something we can reflect further on. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure if I can say something or is somebody, yeah. Oh, but now I can't Very hear. quickly, go on. Yeah, yeah. So it just on uh, the, the points raised about being mindful on social media or through the use of new media technology to say, please do not give yourself too much responsibility of what is beyond you. We know one thing, social media is a double-edged sword. The government themselves are using it to perpetrate propaganda, to discredit the protest. And it's the age of new deep fake where people can create images and videos that will look so true and look undeniable. But what I've seen with the NSAS protests is people come out quickly to speak, to counter, to provide information that will lead to verification of certain allegations that they did so well. But in the spectrum of how big the social media platform is, it might be something that cannot be achieved to say we are going to be free of propaganda, we are not going to uh, allow hijacking, knowing fully whether even this country curated different layers of, um, what, what do you call it? Different levels of um, youth engagement. Some they engage by being answerable to the government and they have come out as well, being used as thugs to disrupt the protest. So some of these things, just to be able to tell that within the reality of social movements and political protest, certain things happen. And the new media technology might not be able to take that away extensively. Thank you very much. Um, Professor Nanshek, I wanted to uh, put this to you. Some, uh, someone has asked also now, uh, going forward, you know what we, uh, Professor Ebo spoke about security sector gov um, governance issues, transformation, all of that. What about the future? What about going forward? We know that when, when the president was challenged, he spoke about a police act um, and he's, he's putting that forward as progress. What, what, do, you, what do you say to that? Um, thank you. I, in fact, I saw, I think I saw something also by um, Chris Sedgwick on, you know, security sector reform and what help can be given to Nigeria. One of the reasons I stopped working exclusively on security and the reform of security was that I saw its great, the great limitations. At a point in time, and Adedij knows this, we've talked about it, we became so technical. So there's clearly a technical bit of work that needs to be done. And you will always be doing reform with the technical work. We can call Russia, China as new actors, uh, bring the old actors, US, UK, Europe, to Nigeria or to anywhere and tell them to support uh, this work. And all you can do is like the uh, 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 Gary and uh, Pounder Jam story, all you can do is just put some technical things in place. When I started looking at the underpinning intentions, 
some of the conversation we've just been having. Because you can be so technical about training the police, uh, having a new police act, having a, a parliamentary committee that oversees. Those principles are correct and you can train and you can give that support, but you cannot change the intentions of a human being through that technical work. So if you, that relationship between those leaders, between our governing elite and society has to have the intention that they want to transform it. And it is that that makes conversation very interesting for this. And that conversation actually does not need any you know, detailed communication around it. If you have the intention to make things better, or if you have the intention to move from point A to point B. Having said that, there's a place for the technical work. What is it? the new police act? We all welcome it. We all welcome the fact that there was a new security policy for the first time uh, last year that went beyond the whole notion of defense, of the protection of the territorial integrity of the country. But the spirit of it, you, you can see that it lacks the intentionality. What is it in the police act that ought to change the way things are done now? It is the relationship of oversight which the police council provides, but the police council rarely meets. Okay, Adedeji said, uh, you know, who watches the, who guards the guardian? Who polices the police? How have we seen in the last 20 years in all the security sector reform work that we've done, when we've done community policing and recommended it and the government has said, yes, we'll roll it out, there's always been one canker. And that's the fact that the highest police of, uh, official, the inspector general of police, you can't track where the oversight comes from unless the direct report to the president. You can't even really see how much control or influence the police service commission has over the inspector general of police, whoever they are, unless they just mean to do well as individuals. You can see that in parliament too, through parliamentary committees. But the highest, at this moment, the police act provides has expanded the role of the police council, but it does not meet. Who is the police council? Who therefore does, you know, a, it has control over the inspector general of police. So there's some really difficult things. And the reason why it's difficult is that if you remove the place of control of the IGP from the center, and so you hope that the president and governors will be these people, but it's not even the governors normally. If you remove it from the center, then the center loses control. And losing this control is at the heart of the issue. Can you trust? that you see the bit of power to other channels of oversight, that actually it improves our relationship. So there's something there that is not just technicality, it is the intention of the leaders to want to change things. It means giving up a little bit of power. That, that's the heart of it, as I understand it. Thank you so much uh, for that. Um, I'm going to hand over to Professor Ibo in a second. Hubert, please, can you... Um invite uh, Adeo Tidikweolu and Adeo Lokwade because I want them to respond to this point on uh, the role of diaspora, please. Thank you. Professor Ibo, please. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Um, honestly, I think you better do a second part of this because we're just getting the conversation started, really. Someone made the right point for me, and I think for me also echoed it, which is the need for really a social contract in which uh, the citizens who are giving up their rights for the formation of a state uh, understand their role in that state and the, the state understands its responsibility to the citizens. What we have now is not a social contract. Mm. You know, like I said, this is a social, this is a colonial inheritance that despite the elections and the constitutions and all the paperwork, as I call it, mm. there has been really no conversation because the government continues to see itself as the master, not the servant of the citizens. So that's, and I've written a long list of what I think we need to do. Uh, and there's no time for that, you said in one second. So I think I wanna go back to Fumi's point about thought leadership. I think that we, we need at some point to put to 
to paper beyond the recording of this session uh, and to push ourselves, maybe at least to start with some publication of what we have discussed. Uh, so it can form the hopefully nutshell of a new uh, conversation on what I think is the need first to demystify the scary sector. You know, uh, the sense of Nigerians studying scary governance in Nigerian universities, not just at Cranfield, you know, at IFE, at uh, University of Ibadan, at ABU, civil society's role, which we had limited to just getting the military out. And once the military left, Nigerian civil society has not been well engaged on, on the broader issues of security sector governance. We need a national conversation, however it's going to take place. Uh, we need what Kofi Annan said. He said that the security institutions should be subject to the same standards of efficiency, of equity, of accountability as any other public service. You know, we need to work on our legislature. What kind of oversight can you get out of a national legislature that itself does not reflect the right attitudes, does not reflect the right attributes? So it becomes not an oversight uh, body, but actually a mirror of all these things we are talking about. Uh, back to Chris's uh, point about, you know, who can help Nigeria? To be honest, honestly, uh, there's a, we are talking about the superficiality of the state system. If you go to ECOWAS, oh, there are a lot of instruments, normative instruments. I remember the ECOWAS uh, security sector governance uh, framework, uh, a code of conduct for armed forces and security services. The African Union has uh, a security sector reform uh, policy framework on which Fumi and I and others like Hotfu worked. The UN has uh, an entire Security Council resolution, uh, 2151, which was done in 2014. That is, it, we are, as Fumi was saying, it's not that we are talking about. Nothing you can do unless and until there's a transformation in the relationship between the citizen and the state, in which the, state, the citizen becomes uh, the master and not the servant of a state that it should belong to it. Back to you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I've, I've brought in here, um, Adeoti and Ade, Adeoti, if you can start us off, Adeoti works on um, diaspora and homelands and how diaspora influence uh, pieces. Hi, Eka, sorry, let me just jump in. Um, okay, I think good. Ade needs to get back to work. Um, so okay. if he can go first. Thank you, Ade, please go on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adeoti, I appreciate it. Can you guys hear me all right? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, good stuff. Um, so yeah, Eka, on your point about the role of um, diaspora, I think the first thing that we really have to think about is the fact that historically, it, it, it seems to me anyway, that the diaspora have been um, accessories after the fact when it comes to these things. Um, the NTARS movement has been really the first opportunity for us to be kind of partners in crime, if that makes sense. Um, we have seen uh, thousands of pounds, thousands of dollars transferred in you know, bank accounts, in Bitcoin, to help people even to do so little as providing food. Um, the other thing that we need to do is that we need to be able to not give voice to those who don't have it because there are millions of Nigerians who have their voice um, and there are powers that be that are trying to silence them. It's being in a position where we can help amplify those voices. So you have things like in, uh, in London, people signing petitions to the government to introduce sanctions to specific individuals in the Nigerian government and people who are associated with the Nigerian government. It's making sure that we, in, in our position of comfort, um, when we are asked to go out and protest, um, you know, we're actually out there physically protesting, that we are writing these think pieces, we are writing these articles, we are communicating with our MPs. I mean, Ariotti and I were there um, in, uh, in and amongst the protest uh, what, two days ago now? Um, and we had we had a couple of MPs come to join us. So Florence Eshalomi, um, Marsha uh, de Cordova come to join us. And it's, it's, it's putting pressure 
on those people who we do in our places of comfort have the ability to put pressure on. But it's also recognizing that we, the two of us, and however many hundreds of people were there on, on uh, Wednesday night or whenever it was, we knew we were not going to be killed by the police. Um, that was the most very basic acceptance amongst all of us, that no matter how bad things got, if they did get bad, we were never going to be killed by the police. So understanding from our position of comfort, from our position of privilege, that these are the most basic things that we can do, not simply to say after the fact, you know, well, the NSARS protest happened and um, I feel really bad about it. It's lending your voice, lending your spending power, lending your political power um, in any way, shape or form that you can. It's educating your friends. One of the things that we saw during lockdown during the Black Lives Matter protest was the fact that our, our white friends, our Asian friends, our Middle Eastern friends wanted to understand what was going on. Um, it's about putting pressure on your friends, your, your colleagues, your acquaintances to attempt to understand what's going on. Um, I myself on Wednesday night, I was speaking to one of the police officers there who said, well, he hadn't heard anything about this. He didn't know why we were protesting. All he knew was that he just had to come there and, and do his job. And all of a sudden he's now saying to me, well, after this, I'm going to go back and do my homework. You know, I've got friends who reached out to me and said, you're constant posting, my friends posting on NSARS. I'd never heard about this. I only heard about it when the BBC started covering the killings. And I said, well, this has been going on at least this latest iteration for the last two weeks. We were there protesting them uh, last year in the middle of my degree outside Nigeria House um, for the incident that happened in Abuja with the 50 women. It's just making sure that we are constantly keeping our foot on the pedal. We're constantly connecting with our family, our friends back home. We're constantly educating ourselves and then we're taking the time to go out and sort of proselytize the word as well. And yeah, I'll hand back to, to Adiati on that point. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good evening. Um, I just uh, thank you to everyone, and it's uh, a pleasure to be part of this panel this evening. Um, there have been a lot of pertinent points made tonight by uh, the distinguished panelists and um, fellow colleagues, and um, I'll just speak briefly to a few of them, and then you know speak about the diaspora. Um, so I think first was this issue of transformation. Um, it resonated with me because I, I, think, I think that's what's needed in Nigeria. I think that's what's needed across the African continent um, is, a need of, is a need for change or transformation um, beyond business as usual. Um, and I say that just in light of not just the security sector, but also just evident gaps in the service sector, you know, um, and just how the youth had banded, have, you know, noticed this and have cried out against this. Um, and so just on Twitter, you know, things like no jobs, we became entrepreneurs, no light, we bought generators, no security, we hired our own guards. You know, so calling to light uh, the evident gaps um, in areas that should be provided by the government. But um, just also in terms of the divides, I think one of the reflections I made was on this idea of mutuality, um, both in terms of the youth and how they came together across the nation, across ethnic, religious and class divides against this issue. And it's because this issue affected everyone in some little way. In terms of the diaspora, we also saw um, this mutuality besides coming together in the diaspora to protest against this issue, I think was the bigger issue of understanding and feeling that sense of despair, just as our loved ones back home are feeling. Um, and, you know, just for me speaking personally, I had sleepless nights thinking of my brother, my cousins who are in Lagos, many of whom attended these protests and knowing that they could very well have ended up dead, um, just, as some of the people we lost. Um, so just things like that are reasons why the diaspora tend to get involved. Um, Ade made a point that, you know, up until now, there hasn't been a movement or a moment in time where the Nigerian diaspora has had to come together uh, this much to address an issue. Um, and so this issue just points to, I think, the fact that there is a lot of 
neutrality between the diaspora and those at home right now uh, concerning SARS. But um, just in the interest of time, I also wanted to talk about the role of technology. Um, I think it's basically paying attention to the fact that technology has linked the diaspora to what is going on and has afforded them the opportunity for real-time engagement um, and just opportunity to give back. Um, so I think those are some things we need to bear in mind moving forward with conversations or the wider conversations, how to engage the diaspora formally. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Adeoti. Uh, to, to all our guests, I think you can see um, there is a great deal to talk about here. I think uh, Professor Ebo said it very aptly that we're going to have to have a few of these and that's certainly what the plan is. And this was a, 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 um, an opportunity to put together a conversation really in the heat of what was going on where opportunity to be in Africa week. And I think what we wanted to bring to all of you is an intergenerational conversation. A lot had been said about conversations between different groups, between different categories of people, about how powerful all of this has been because of different groups of people speaking to each other. And so we thought a way to engage that is actually to bring different groups of people to speak about these issues from different disciplinary um, strands. But also this question of generation, I think is very, very important. And at the heart of that is to begin to talk about the ideas that will move us forward, move us forward um, beyond this moment to transform this process into transformational leadership as has been discussed. So with that, I've gone over by two minutes. Um, I want to thank my panelists very, very much. Thank you so much for very, very rich conversation today at a very critical pertinent time. Thank you so much to all our participants. Thank you for being with us, uh, for joining us and for you know journeying with us through Africa Week up until now. Definitely please watch this space. There's going to be a lot more coming out um, around this. And we're going to be spreading this conversation beyond Nigeria, as we noted before, and as several panelists have said, this is an issue that is pertinent to the, to the whole of the, of, of the continent. And in many ways, it's part of our Pan-African um, agenda to engage this in that way. So with that, I say a very big thank you to you. Um, all of this is being recorded, as I said, so anything you've missed will be up there. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for joining us for Africa Week. Look after yourselves and uh, watch this space, uh, uh, continue to uh, follow us uh, to hear more about all of this. Thank you so much uh, and goodbye. <laughs>